Apparently, are they still at the desk down the bottom there? Or they, or they, yeah. They're still there, eh? Uh, Barry, won't you just come here? Yeah, but I don't know if you can hear me there, Barry, but please, won't you just come? Barry's, Barry shared a, 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 a word with us as an eldership team at our elders' planning in November last year. And then again, he just reminded me of it in, uh, in January. And um, I would love him to share it. And then also, Barbara, if you could come. Have we got that other microphone, guys, the handheld? Johnny, if we could get the handheld microphone. Listen, don't worry if we're not projecting at the back. As long as they can see what we're going to project on the front, then I'm happy. Okay, so don't stress it. Um, Raphael and Barbara, where's Barbara? You remember you said that there's that word on unity. I feel like this is a time of unity and that God is wanting to unite us. See, si, see. Si. Do you remember that? So I want you to get ready to share that. Barry, is Barry here? There he comes. There we go. Barry's a bit old. Ian, is that what you said? Eh? <laughs> Barry, Ian's just, uh, he's, uh, he's throwing you under the bus here, but. <laughs> While Barry's coming, I want you to think just, I'm going to ask you a question. I want to ask you, I want, to, I want you to, uh, I'm going to ask you, what is God's will for your life? I want you to ask, what is God's will for my life? Write it down on your notepad if you're taking notes. Just for 2023, what is God's will for your life? Please write it down. Barry, won't you come up? But I'm, I'm actually waiting for you. Thanks. But it's the it's the it's the one about the prophecy being fulfilled. Don't say. Okay. Um, maybe you got it there. I'm know. gonna look for what you care and talk. Okay. Um. Yeah, it was just, I think it was out of Ezekiel where, where, um, <coughs> where God gives a, just a prophetic word eh, to Israel. That, 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 and he says this, eh, the time is now eh, for the prophetic words to be fulfilled. And, um, and I know we've had so many prophetic words over the lighthouse. And it's time, Father, that these prophetic words get fulfilled. But more than that, you know, Father, may we walk in those prophetic words. Eh? Amen. Okay, so I, th I thought you might have the reference. Maybe, maybe look for it, Barry, you know, while Barbara's coming up. But it was such a key time because it, it, it's saying that the people are saying, ah, you know, the prophetic words are long in coming. They're never going to be fulfilled. You know, it's, it's always next year and then next year and next year. But then the Lord says, hey, God says, now is the time. And now is the fulfillment of my things. Amen. All right, Barbara. No, not a preach, just a quick share on. Yeah, I just want to greet you all. Just maybe when come, stand over here, just let you in the shot. There we go. Uh, when I was just praying for, the year, for this year, 2023, in January, uh, I got a word from God. It was about unity, uh, unity of families. Uh, especially I was praying for my family and I was... God just give me a, gave me a word, which is in Psalms 133. It says, Behold how, pleasant, behold, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on their head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the call of his robes. So I just felt that unity, when we unite, as a church, when we unite in our families, there God pours his blessing. So it was like when you are together, nothing can come between you because you are united, you are, are walking in one spirit in everything that you are doing, you are doing it together. So the enemy cannot get between you because between you there is God, God is united with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it was deeply emphasized for this year to unite as a church. There we will realize the blessing of the, of the Lord between us. Amen. 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 I remember a couple of years ago being in Zimbabwe. You, you got it, Barry? Okay, good. We can share in a few secs. And John and Pampuli, a friend of mine, was preaching, and he spoke on this Psalm 133. 
And he said this. He says, picture God on his throne, right? And he says, um, for there you, God commands life and blessing forevermore. Now just a picture of God on his throne. Life! Come here! Now God's commanding life. Go to the Nesbitt family. Go to the Parazai family. Go to the Macalpan family. Go to the Gibson family. Go to the Thompson family. Why, God? Because there's unity there. I'm commanding you to go there. Go to Lighthouse to the Nations Church. Why? There's unity there. Blessing. Come here. Blessing. I'm commanding you. Go to the Kazunga family. Go to those families. Is that an amazing thing that, hey? Eh? Where there is unity, there God commands his life and blessing forevermore. Power, so powerful is unity. Listen to what it says in Genesis 11, verse 6. This is when they're building the Tower of Babel. And it's, the Lord says, the Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. Come let us go down and confuse their language. And that's how the nations were birthed and different la languages and tongues came into being. But God's testimony is that a people united with one plan, one purpose, one thing, nothing is possible for them. Isn't that amazing? Hey? And so, <laughs> that's important to understand that we need to protect unity, amen? And what Vision Weekend, it's, it's hopefully all of us coming under one thing to understand what is God doing, where is God taking us, and what are we uniting behind for this year? Does that make sense? Okay, Barry, come and share that scripture now, please put. You know, I was disobedient to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told me, message Barry and ask him to share this tonight. And I just ran out of time. Sorry, buddy, I put you on the spot. It's my fault. I'll take our own this one. <laughs> Sorry, can I take yeah, it? yeah, of course. Um, okay, yeah, it's out of Ezekiel 12, verse 21, and then Make just a, a couple of, of verses there on. And it says this, Again, a message came to me from the Lord, Son of Man. You've heard that proverb they quote in Israel. Time passes and prophecies come to nothing. Wow. Tell the people this, what the Sovereign Lord says. I will put an end to that proverb, and you will soon stop quoting it. Now give them this new proverb to replace the old one. The time has come for every prophecy to be fulfilled. And then verse 26. And then this message came to, the, came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people of Israel are saying, he's talking about a distant future. His visions won't come true for a long, long time. Therefore tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. No more delays. I will now do everything I have threatened. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. That's quite an interesting passage of Scripture, isn't it? And it's, to be honest, it's not one that I'm particularly f f familiar with. Certainly, it, I hadn't caught my attention up until Barry sh shared it in November. And i tell you why it's significant. It's most probably significant for more of us that have been in Lighthouse for the last 21 years because we've got some incredible promises from God and some incredible prophetic words that we have been holding on to and, and building towards literally for 21 years. And I'll be honest with you, at some time in that process, you can sometimes think to yourself, well, time passes and prophecies come to nothing. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? But we know that the Bible says through faith and patience, perseverance, we inherit the promises. And when Barry shared that prophetic word with us, and that, that, well, that scripture with us, I, I really felt a quicken in my heart. And I felt God saying, my purposes for Lighthouse are being quickened, and they're coming to pass in a much bigger way than the previous years. And I want you to hear that as a church. And I'll tell you why that's significant. Like I said already, this, this is a core group of people. Yeah. Okay, when we planted our church, we planted with 30 people from Cornerstone. And I spent six months preparing the core for the church plant before we planted. And we, we planted and literally within about two, two, two months, we had doubled to 60. Are you with me? 
But the, so now we had 30 people that understood our vision and our values and knew where we were going, but then there were another 50% that didn't have a clue who we are, where we're going, what we're doing. But because the 30 had been grounded properly and had understanding, it was easier for the other 30 to be able to get swept up into where God wanted to go. Does that make sense? And it's so important that we, all of us here, for those that have just joined, for those that have joined, for those that have been here one year, two years, that you understand what God has said, what God is doing, and where He wants to go. Because I think, I don't know about so much this year, but maybe towards the end of this year, but then into next year, God's going to put His foot on the pedal. You know, in the, in the markets, in the property market, there can be a bull run. You get a bull market and you get a bear market. And a bull market is when the, the prices start to run and things start to escalate. Am I right, Stephen? And then a bear market is when the prices are dropping and so people, people are selling and holding their cash because the prices are going down and then they'll buy at a lower price. But I, I have this, I really believe this, that we're about to see an acceleration into the things of God and there's going to be this bull run that God's going to do with us. And people are going to get saved and people are going to get added to us. And we need a whole core of people that understand our vision and our values and what God has said and what we're doing to be able to lead those new people into what God has got for them. Are you with me there? And this is why this weekend is important. Because I think, I'll be honest with you, We've t- we took, we'll look a little bit at what we talked about last year, but last year we preached a whole lot of stuff. And we've been massaging that in. And we're going to talk to a whole lot of stuff this year. I mean, massaging it in. But all of that stuff is important for people that are going to get added and get saved here. And we all need to, it's not good for me to know it. It's not good for the elders to know it. It's not even good for the deacons to know it. We need the mature priests. We need the, we need the, the core team of this church to, 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 to be united to speak a common language, understanding a common vision, a common set of values, and where we're going so that we're not confused. Because when other people come in, let me tell you, they come in with their own agendas, they come in with their own plans, they come in with their own ideas. And we're not going to go with them, they're going to go with us. Now, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but God's been building something for 21 years, and we're not going to let that get hijacked in 21 months. Which means that we better have a good understanding of what God wants to do and what He said. Does it, are you with me there? All right. So I think that's it's very significant that, that you do that. Now, ask, you should ask me, well, why do you say that, Bruce? Why do you say there's going to be this bull run? Why do you say there's going to be this acceleration? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? And I'll tell you why I say it. I say it because, actually, just two reasons. You know, the Bible speaks about first in the natural, then in the spiritual. Yeah, that's a principle. Okay, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The second man, Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. First in the natural, then in the spiritual. God is entrusting us as a church with this facility. And tomorrow I'll show you the plans that we have for this facility. But he's basically giving us seven million rand to, to redo this whole thing with kids' ministry, uh, auditorium, coffee shop, all of it. Are you with me? Okay. It's a 350, yeah, amen, amen. It's a 350 seater auditorium, which is not big, but if you have three services, that's 1,200 people, and that is big. You understand that? And God doesn't do that so that it can remain empty. He does that because he wants it filled, and he wants it, it's not about the building. It's about the people that are going to fill that building because God lives inside of people. And then at the church house, you know, we, we know that for those of you that have been there, you've seen that synagogue across the road. That we've been trusting for a property in that area for 15 years. And, um, you know, this, that synagogue across the road has become available for sale. They spoke to us June last year, and we said, yeah, we're interested. Then they said, look, we're going through Passover and all our holy days. We'll get back to you in three months' time. So three months' time for them was six months. In the week of our prayer and fasting, they came back to me and said, are you still interested? I said, but of course we're interested. We've been waiting for six months. What's happening? He said, things are afoot, but be busy working. We'll come back to you. But that's still very much a, a real possibility, 
and a very much a real thing that's happening there. So when I look into what God is doing into our future, I can see that he's setting us up here for victory and he's positioning us beautifully. And then when I look there, I can see he's doing exactly the same thing. Now that building is a 500-seater auditorium with a whole lot of stuff on it. Are you with me? And we are going to need <laughs> so many leaders and people and things when that happens. We need, we, you, your head needs to be right now. Your heart needs to be right now. You, you need to know what God has said, where God is taking us and what he's doing so that you, so that you can be positioned to run with what God wants to do. Now, guys, I don't know if you understand how beautiful and special it is to get into something just before it's about to take off. Am I right? The first guys to invest in that thing, the first guys to be involved in that thing, that, 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 that there's just going to be a return on investment that is going to be out of this world for those people. And I, I have to believe that for every one of us, those that are here, but also those watching online and the rest of Lighthouse, God has been assembling this team of people for what he wants to do. And you're a part of it. You're a part of it. Don't minimize the part that you can play. Is it, does that make sense? Okay. So, I asked you a question before we started. What do you think God's will for your life in 2023 is? Did you write it down? What is God's will for my life? Because I hopefully I'm going to tell you what I believe God's will for your life is and what your will for our life is for 2023. Okay? Now, before I get into that, I, w- I want to I wanna kind of tell you what I think God is doing right now in the last three, four months, and I- even the beginning of this year, with me and with us, as I look at it. O- you would have all heard of me speak on, on um, the revelation that God has given me over December and into January about the Father, being God the Father, and then me the Father, and then my sons and daughters, Michael, and how Michael is lining up with my will and then the Father's will and God's favor is coming. You've seen that, all right? I'm shocked and stunned at the impact that that's having in my life. I'll tell you one little update in the little story because it's a little bit of a developing story. So you know that Michael's going to PE, you know that we're setting him up there and all of those things. So two weeks ago, we were having dinner around the dinner table. And Michael used to have a Suzuki scooter that Jonathan now drives. So when you see a black little scooter that Jonathan's driving, that was Michael's transport when he was 18 and going to school, but we didn't have money to buy him a car yet. So we bought him this little scooter. And it was actually great for him because it gave him a bit of independence, right? So then, then we, we were able to bless him with a car, and then he sold his scooter to Jonathan for a really good deal. And Jonathan's been using that because Jonathan needed transport when he had married Terry. They've got one car, a scooter. (laughs) Terry on the back. Okay, so now we're having this meal at our home. And I say to Michael, you know, Michael, but in in PE, everything's five, ten minutes, you know. He's staying in Summer Strand. The university is five minutes away. The church where he's going to go is five minutes away. The beach is two minutes away. I said, I reckon... Now, remember, because he got all those A's, the university is going to give us some discount on his fees. And him and I have agreement, we're going to go 50-50 on the fee discount, okay? Because I paid, I paid all the school fees over 12 years, so it's a lot of money, so I need to get something back. But he, he did the work, so he needs to get something back. You get it, okay? So everyone's getting blessed. And I said to him, what the best thing I think that you should do with that money is invest in a little run-around scooter. You can pick them up second-hand for about five to 7,000 rand. The fuel that you'll save will be incredible. Because he's on a student budget, so he knows you've got to budget these things. He says, flat that, that's a brilliant idea. I think I'm going to do that. This, now, Monday, this Monday, I'm sitting having my quiet time, eh? And I'm praying for Michael. And I'm thinking about this whole deal. Listen to this. this, is a, this is, hope this blows you away like it blew me away. So I'm having my quiet time, and the Lord says to me, you know the scooter door deal with Michael? I say, yeah, he says, what's in your garage? So 
at my house, we've got a little garage where the, the boys' toys are, okay? And there's three motorbikes there. And they are they're off-road motorbikes, right? But the last, the, so there's one for me, one for Michael. David had one, but he sold it when he became a student because he needed cash. So I bought a third one, not for David, for guests that I take with me when I go ride, but obviously David can use it, okay? But if I give it to him, he's going to sell it again for money, so I'm <laughs> keeping it. Are you with me? So it's not his, it's mine. But the, I bought it for my brother Greg, and he had, the, he, the kind of a motorbike, it's an it's a Enduro, so it's an on-road and it's an off-road. And I bought it from him with a whole box of everything you need to convert that bike back into an on-road motorbike. So the Lord says to me, there's no need for Michael to buy a scooter. Let him give you his motorbike. You give him the one you bought from Greg. He's got 10 days now before he goes to PE. Let him put the road kit conversion onto that motorbike. For nothing, he's got a mo motorbike in PE that he can ride around on, and he can use the money for something else. Now, guys, I don't, I'm sitting there, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, we have a resource that we're not even thinking about. Do you understand? But the Lord, the Father, the good Father in heaven, He knows. And He knows what's happening. And He just comes and just pours out a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of insight that changes the game for Michael. And now the guy has got a bonobite that he can use there and he's still got cash that he can buy something else with. What a father. What a God. What does that do for you? Now, I know mean, not, you're not personally involved, but for me, as a father, wanting to bless my son, because I see him making brilliant decisions for his life. And then I see the father empowering, because remember, it's my motorbike that I'm giving him, I'm swapping him, basically. But you know what? I was so excited to tell David this, and my Michael this, and to share the idea with him. I couldn't wait for him to wake up. <laughs> and then I tell him, Man, this smile goes from this ear to this ear. <laughs> and you can ask the family. He worked most nights till 12 o'clock getting that bike right. He rode with it today. He's got all the papers. He's transferring ownership on Monday. Now, the bar, Jesus says this. If you, being evil, know how to give your children good gifts. Now, what's the key? How much more? Won't you Heavenly and Father give you the things that you need and that you ask for. Now, now, so, now, now that whole story was to say this. What is God doing at us with the lighthouse right now? That's what he's doing. He's wanting to give this church a revelation of himself as Father, that he's good, that he's loving, that he's kind, that he's gracious, that he's compassionate, that he's slow to get angry, that he's quick to forgive, that he's for you. And he, listen to me carefully now, he wants you and me to align our lives like never before with his will, his plans, and his purposes. Because where he's going and where he's taking us, like with Michael, aligned himself with my plans and the Father's plans, and now those plans have got God's favor and God's blessing and have got my favor and blessing for every single one of us. I believe this with everything inside of me. That's what God is wanting light us to hear this weekend. If, as you align your family, your life, your lifestyle with me and my purposes in Johannesburg, in Lighthouse, in Nord, and in Edenvale, you are going to see my hand come upon you and take you where you never thought possible. Now, not too many of you are making notes, but what I've just told you, you need to make notes on. It's massive, that. It's huge. That's what God is doing with us right now. Now, I think that that's a process. I'm 51. I've been a pastor, leading this church 21 years. Four years a pastor before that. I've been a Christian since I was nine years old. And I can honestly say, Never in my life have I had this revelation 
of God as Father like I'm having it right now. And in that, prof- that word on, on unity and, 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 and where does the, 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 the anointing flows from the head down the beard onto the robe onto the rest of his body. And if that God is doing that with me and he's doing that with this eldership team, I want to tell you it's going to flow from the head down onto this whole body and we need to be aware of it. And you need to be saying in this, right now, in this season, you need to be saying, Father, reveal yourself to me. Holy Spirit, lead me into the truth of the Father. Lord Jesus, reveal the Father to me and Father, reveal Jesus to me. I don't want to doubt your love, your goodness, your grace, your kindness, your compassion. I don't want to doubt any of those things. Are you with me? I'm driving to our management meeting on Monday morning after all of this has happened. Now, the, you need to understand, guys. <laughs> I'm learning here. I'm learning. Are you with me? I'm, I'm humble enough to, to admit to you guys that I'm learning about the Father right now as I'm speaking to you this week. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually stunned at how God is doing this. And he drops, a, he drops a verse into my heart. He has the verse. The Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I don't even have the reference for you. I haven't even had time. This is so hot and so fresh that I haven't had time to go and look for the reference. But the Lord, and I just, it's like, I'm seeing the Lord rewarding Michael as he is learning. And I'm seeing how I'm rewarding Michael as he's aligning with what I believe God's will is for his life. Hebrews 11 verse 6, thank you so much. God, those who come to me him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who deliberately seek him. So I want to ask you, what is God's will for your life for 2023? I'd like to suggest to you one of the most primary things that's God's will for us for 2023 is this, to diligently seek him this year. Make it a goal. I, okay, so this is my goal. Hey guys, based on what I'm telling you now, what I preached on Sunday, what I preached at the church house the week before, I, it's like I'm, this is what I'm thinking to myself. Bruce, why would you ever want to do any other will except your Father in Heaven's will? That's how clear I'm seeing it. When you understand, like, as God, as good as He is and what He's doing, you think to yourself, you, you've got to be stupid to choose anything other than the Father's will for your life. Am I right? As we sit there now, you can understand that. But you know what the problem is? The heart of man. My heart. It doubts. It doubts God. Fear. Unbelief. Doubt. Is he really that good? Maybe that's true for Steve. Maybe that's true for Barry. But, mm, does God really love me? Am I right? And that's just me. That's just me. That's me, Bruce McAlpine. Then you've got this whole dynamic of Satan and who wants to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. Am I right? And he, in the Garden of Eden, even before Adam and Eve had sinned, before they had fallen, his tactic was to get Eve to doubt the goodness of God. God knows if you eat of that tree, you'll become like him. In other words, God's holding out on you. God doesn't want you to have some good stuff. God already said to him, if you eat of it, you'll die. Satan's coming. You, Satan says this, watch out. You will surely not die. God says you'll die. He says you will surely not die. 180 degrees opposite to what God had said. Now watch out. God, Satan, me, and my little heart. And this is the cosmic battle of the age. God created human beings in his image and in his likeness. 
He gave them artificial intelligence. Our intelligence in comparison to God's intelligence, he's got the, he's got the real intelligence, am I right? We like got the artificial intelligence, talking about AI stuff, right? He chose to give us free, human free will and free choice. And he understood the price would be that we'd make the wrong choice. That Jesus would come have to die for our choice. And he'd have to reconcile us to God. And then even once we have been reconciled to him for the rest of our lives, there would always be the struggle between my will and God's will, my will and Satan's will, and whose will am I going to line up with? Is this helpful? Now, I know that's so elementary and basic, but see, this is what happened in a bull run. Uh, honestly, bull run, when I say bull run, it's another way of saying revival. I think what revival is, is when men and women in a community's hearts just line up with the Father's will, and it's all, they slip streaming, and it's just, there's an ease with which that happens. You understand that? But something has got to happen for that to take place. And that's what I think God is happening right now. Happy with that? Okay, so kind of my first big point for this weekend is God is up to something at us. When I look at the physical things that he's positioning us with, I've been in church long enough and in business too long enough, when those things all align up, God's about to do something, we better get ready for it. What's he doing right now, he is showing us that he's a good father, that he rewards those who diligently seek him, and if we will make choices that will line up with him, you, got, you can't believe what God's going to do with us. Are you with me? Now, there's one, that's my, now, now my second point. My second point, or a big point tonight. Tyron Daniels, I can't take credit for this point. Tyron that leads New Covenant, he taught us this. He says this. Most people that you meet as a pastor or as a leader of a flow or something, you know, you're meeting with pastors, they, they always want to know what's God's will for my church? What's God's will for my life? They, wa they want to know the specific will of God for their situation. Who do I marry? Who, which leaders do I release? Which house do I buy? Which job do I take? Where do my kids go to school? How many kids do I have? What car? All these life things that you want to make. Is, this is, the gain on this is a little bit, it's like, can we turn the, move it away a bit, like that. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Almost every, so often, a lot of when we're counseling people, we're counseling them to find out the specific will of God for their life. Amen. Now, don't get offended by what I'm going to say, but just hear what I want to say without getting offended. Some people have got a preoccupation with the specific will of God for their life. And you know why that is? Because unfortunately, as human beings, we are predominantly selfish. And what I've often seen, particularly in Christians, guys, we become so fixated on God's specific will for our lives, and we become consumed with ourselves. And that's the most dangerous place to be. And I'll explain it to you now. Is it good to have a desire for the will of God to come in your life? 100%, I've just talked about it. But this is what Tyron Daniel said, listen to this. You can even write it down. The key for you to walk in and discover God's specific will for your life is to do the general will of God for your life well. Let me say that again. The absolute number one key for you to discover and walk in to the specific will of God for your life is to pay attention to and to do the general will of God well without becoming preoccupied with the specific will. Do you understand that? Now let me unpack it for you a little bit like he did with us. He says this, most of the people that God used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, 
God found them, and God's specific will for them found them, they didn't find it. And they were not even looking for it when, they, when it found them. So what do you mean? Moses, burning bush. Was he waking up every single morning, when am I going to get my burning bush? I want to see the burning bush. Preoccupied with the burning bush. Moses didn't even know he was having a burning bush encounter. Yes? But what was he doing? He was doing the general will of God well, which was looking after his father-in-law's sheep, doing a good job of it on the far side of the mountain. And God had trained him to be a prince in Egypt and in, for 40 years, and then he had trained him to be a shepherd in the desert for 40 years. Because God's specific will for his life was that Moses was going to lead a million Jewish men and their wives and children and livestock in the wilderness for 40 years. But in order to lead them in the wilderness for 40 years, he had to go back to Egypt and set them free. Now, not any shepherd can just rock up in Egypt and speak to Pharaoh. You've got to have a bit of insight into how Pharaoh works and the whole hierarchy and political system. He knew exactly how it worked. But last time I checked, I don't think a prince who grew up in a palace could last in a desert for four days, not 40 years. Because he's used to having fans blown in him and his fingernails done. He doesn't understand what it means to live in a desert. Yes or no? Can you see how God had Taylor made and designed Moses' life for his plans and purposes? What about King David? King David, just a shepherd boy, playing his harp, playing with his sling. In the course of those events, the lion or the bear would come and attack the sheep. And just the, 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 doing the general will of God well, do a good job, be a good shepherd. What does that mean? Be, put yourself between the, shepherd, between the sheep and the lion and the bear. And your job is to look after those sheep for your dad. Now, if you ask David's dad, Jesse, Jesse, what would you want? Lion takes off a few sheep, but your son's life is spared? Or your son puts his life at risk and he protects your sheep? What do you want, Jesse? Every father on the planet is going to say, no, I want my son. I want my son. But every son should be saying, no ways. I've been given a responsibility by my dad, and I'm going to look after the sheep in my life. And every dad will, will in his heart be like, that's my boy. You understand? Of course he doesn't want his boy to die, but like he wants his boy to be a man. And so what happens? He's doing this well. So just during the course of events, his dad calls him and says, hey, my boy, I want you to go to the front lines. These 10 cheeses I want you to take to, to your brother's. I want you to give them to the commanders. How are your brothers doing? Tell me how. I'm just concerned about them. No problem, Dad. The Bible says he leaves the sheep with a hired hand. He doesn't just leave them. You know, he's a young boy. He's excited to go see what's going on in the battle there. He, he leaves the sheep and the good care. He's faithful. And he, you know, also some boys are like, oh, Dad, I don't want to take the sheep. Like, you know, my kids sometimes, they don't want to serve, you know. My, David doesn't complain about this errand. He goes. Was he looking for Goliath? Did Goliath find David or did David find Goliath? My friends, God ordained that day. And God set David up for victory. And the specific will of God found David that day. And he killed that Goliath. He cut off his head, my friend, and he became commander of, of Saul's army. Are you with me? Now watch out. One last example from the New Testament. Saul, the apostle Paul, who was Saul before. Now he was being faithful and he was being sincere, but he was sincerely wrong because he was killing Christians. He was persecuting Christians, but he was doing such a damn good job of it. The Lord said to him, you know what, I can use this oak. If this guy is so passionate about killing my people, if I can win his heart, he'll be so passionate about saving them. And even if you're sincerely wrong, if you're doing it faithfully, God can use that. And God smacked him off his horse, 
revealed himself to him. Do you, you think Paul was looking to be smacked off his horse? Do you think he was looking for the specific will of God? No chance. But he was being faithful to what he believed was God's will for his life, and he was protecting what he believed to be true. God just had to help him with his belief system, and then he became this guy that was amazing. What's the principle? Okay, let me give you, this is important now. One last example, and I hope this helps you. Let's pretend you're an Israelite. Let's pretend you're from the tribe of Levi. And let's pretend you were born in Aaron's household. Now, you're part of this community. You're wandering in the desert, and you're hutful of desert, and manna, and quail, and this pillar of cloud that every time it moves, you've got to set down this tabernacle and all of this stuff, and then it moves for like two kilometers, then it stops. Now you've got to unpack everything, you've got to put it up again. And like God has been misbehaving in the last three weeks as things move two kilometers every three days, and you don't want to move anymore. You've got it up to you. Why can't he just give us a building of our own, and a temple of our own, that we don't have to move? So you just sit there, you, 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 find a, you go find a tree there in the desert, you're in your muff tree. You're like, Wah! He said, God, I am not moving from this tree. And you tell, you tell me, what is your will for my life? And what the hell's going on in my life? And you're sitting under the muff tree and the cloud starts to move. And your whole community, they're leaving you, but because you insisting that God must revolve his whole world around you and his specific will for your life community is gone. Now, if you were a Levite, that meant that you looked after the tabernacle. If you were a a relative of Aaron in his house, that meant you were a priest in that tabernacle. And if you were an Israelite, it meant that what God was doing in this season of your life for these 40 years, he was taking you from Egypt, through the desert, and into the promised land. And if you just got on board with that and just did what you're supposed to do within that community, generally well, you would have got to the promised land, you would have got your inheritance, and you would have gone into the thing with the rest of them. Is that helpful? And that's what you've got to understand. It's like, what is God's will for my life for 2023? My friend, your God's will for your life for 2023 is do His general will well. Be being a part of this church, by being a part of your job, by being a part of your family, are you with me? And faithfully, diligently, ask God for His empowering grace to serve wherever you find yourself and to lead and do whatever you do. And I can promise you this. Those of us that diligently seek the will of the Father and do His general will well, in the coming months and years, as he does this bull run with us. He is going to promote and he's going to give more responsibility and more things because you have been faithful with the general will that he has for us as a church. I don't know if that makes sense. And I'm telling you, it's that easy. It's that easy. God is a good God. If you ask him about the specific will for your life and he's not giving you answers, guess what you do? You relax. You don't stress. You don't fret. And you don't worry. You just do the things that you're supposed to do, knowing that your good daddy, when the time is right for you, will tell you the next step. And you do that next step. And then, once you've done that next step, and you've done it well, you'll do the next step. And then the next step. That's what I see with Michael. You heard He made some changes to his schooling career. He made a humble decision. That was three years ago. That set him up for victory. Boom, 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 boom. And now I just see how God is working through his life. Now, what I'm telling you, guys, it's a revelation to me. I've known it, but now I'm knowing it. Like if I knew it 50%, yes, like now I know it 90%. I won't say no to 100%. Are you with me? But again, it's like, okay. We're just going to keep on being a base church, being a healing community, loving God, loving people, Serving this nation, serving the nations, we're going to do that. And God's going to bless it. You with me? Happy with this so far? 
Any questions? Happy. So guys, it's quarter to eight. We're stopping at Hopper's Head. We've got 45 minutes. Do you want a break? You can quickly go to the bathroom, get something, some, some water there or something, or do you want us to push through to Hopper's Head? Can we just push through? Okay, fantastic. So, let me just get to my notes here so that I make sure that I'm taking you down the path that we need to be going. So, the will of the, what we need to align with the will of the Father. He's a good Father. He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Understand the difference between the general will of God and the specific will of God. Now, oh, help me, Jesus. I want to remind you of what we kind of have gone through the last year. And it's very important you understand it, okay? Because I really believe this, that what we are teaching and what we're learning at Lighthouse is the general will of God for every church and every believer all of the time. And if we learn how to do that well, and at the moment what's happened in the last year, we've heard it, we've had a theory. We've been preaching about it, we've been getting the, the, the theory of and the, the theology of it, yeah? But I think what's happening and what's going to happen in this 2023 is, it's not just, it's not going to become theory, but you're going to start to assimilate it into your life and it's got, going to start to become practice. It's going to be a part of your life. It's going to be a part of your daily routine. You're going to learn how to do these things. Uh, the best way I can describe it like, is like this. You know when you first learned to drive a car? And especially if it was a manual car. And you had to learn how to, all at the same time, keep your eyes on the road, know which is the brake, which is the clutch, which is the accelerator, learn how to put the clutch in, learn how to put it into first, learn how to pull off without stalling, then learn to keep on driving, looking left and right, and then don't look down, change the gears, and continue. You remember that first time you had to do that, hey? Now, when you get in your car and you go home tonight, you're going to do all of that without even thinking. Am I right? So, I think for the whole of last year, we were hearing about trees of life, rivers of life, fruits of the Spirit, seven manifestations of the Spirit, the rock, the roots, and all of these things. Now, if you have no clue what I'm talking about, then you've got to get the theology still. Are you with me? If you have an understanding of what I'm talking about, great. I want to then ask you, that what I'm talking about, are, is it, are you living it? And is it... Or... Are you still learning how to pull off in first? Are you still learning how to change the gears? Are you still learning how to let all of those things flow in your life? If you ask me, so I think I'm about five years on this journey of the rock and the roots and all of those things. And what, I, what, I'm, what I'm discovering is it's starting to become habitual. It's starting to become second nature. And I hope that doesn't sound arrogant or proud because I tell you, I, it's... I really understand it's the grace of God that I'm living in. But you can, you can ask my family. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm more surprised than anyone else of the changes that are taking place in my life and in my heart as I'm living like this. I can't believe it. Really, I can't believe it. I'm like, Bruce McAlpine in that situation a year ago and Bruce McAlpine in the situation now and maybe I'll tell you tomorrow a situation that just happened this week. I'm like, God, I can't even believe it's the same oak. And, I, and, I'm, and in this one scenario, I lost some money and I paid, overpaid someone and I was actually happy that I did. <laughs> really, I so could see that God wanted to bless that person before. It would have burnt my backside that I've, just, now I've lost 1,800 rand or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? But it's because of all of these things that, are, that have been taking place. Happy with that? Now, we're going to read some scripture. And while we read the scripture, I'm going to just unpack some things that we've learned last year for you. Is that okay? Now, again, like Zander, Gabby, you guys, you're new. The slides are going to come up. Most probably you haven't seen them before. Don't panic. Okay? 
there's going to be quite a bit of information shared here, but it's not new, inform it's new information if you've never heard it before. But for most of us who were here the whole of last year, it's not new information. All I'm asking you to do is this. Is this information that I'm assimilating and applying and I'm learning how to do that, or have I actually got this information down? And I'm not, remember what the man who built his house on the rock, who built his house on the sand. The one heard and didn't do, that's the guy on the sand. The other guy heard and did, that's the guy on the rock. The problem to build on the rock, it takes time. You know, you've got to chip away at that rock to put the foundation in. This takes time. Are you with me? Now, why am I telling you this? Because what I'm going to share with you, I am 400, after being a Christian for 40 years, of being a pastor for 25, and leading this for t church for 21 years, I am 100% convinced that what I'm telling you is God's will for every church of every age and every believer across the planet. And when we line up with these things, that favor and that grace and that stuff that I'm talking about, the Father's will, will line up in your life and you will not begin to understand what the rewards and the... Now it's not about the rewards. I've got to be careful. It's about life with God and experiencing His life and His grace and His favor and His life and blessing on your marriage, with your children, in your business, in your life group, on your church. You, you just start to see the life of God exploding around you. And the amazing thing, it's not hard. It's, uh, it's not effortless, but it's automatic because of the way you're living. Does that make sense? All right, good. So, Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just get there. Now again, please, Jesus, let this be revelation and let them not dial out as we read this. Okay, so we're going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Okay? No, we've got to go to chapter verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You ready for this? Okay, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, ev in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now let's just pause there. Okay? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's one thing to believe that God is good and that God was good to Jesus. Amen? It's another thing to believe that God is good and God wants to be good to you and that while as God was Jesus' Father, God wants to be your Father specifically. Now, you should pause there and say, okay, Bruce, give me a verse where you can show me that as Jesus was fathered by God, and as much as God was pleased with Jesus, that he's pleased with me. So, John chapter 21. Jesus resurrects from the dead. He hasn't appeared to all his disciples, but he speaks to Mary. And he says this to Mary. Mary, Go tell them that I'm returning to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Boom. Jesus is saying, listen, because of just what I've done on the cross now, my Father has become your Father and my God has become your God and I've reconnected you to the Father. Now the scripture reference 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You Christ was reconciling the world to himself. God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ. Are you with me? And now we are those that share that message with others. So, you need to see this thing, that God is as much your father right now as he was Jesus' father. Next thing. Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Now, this is where you, your brain can tilt, because certainly mine does. I want you to ask yourself this question. How much blessing, Steve, is every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the spiritual realm? Jane, how much blessing has God blessed Jesus with? 
Because that scripture is telling us that you have been blessed in the same way. Why is this thing, is it it's not going lacquer? The screen, eh? Is it working or not? Okay, because now I'm going to need those screens to project. Jesus, help us get this technology right. I, I need you to see that. I want you to think. I want you to think with me. I want you to engage your brain, and I want you to think. What does that mean? He has blessed you, Ian, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. What does that mean you have access to? What does that mean that you can, can receive? What does it mean that you can live from there? What does that mean practically for you? Because honestly, as I read that now, based on what I've taught you for this whole last year, I can give you a list of 50 things that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that me and you have got access to in God's presence and we can draw on his blessing anytime we need it. And I'm experiencing it and I'm living in it and it's blowing me away. Now, I'm going to unpack it for you, but, but I, as, as you sit there, I, you need, I want you to ask yourself, what does that mean for me? Can I unpack? If someone came into Lighthouse and they were just saved or they were coming from another church and you were trying to teach them our vision, our values and what God has got to do with us and you had the responsibility of teaching them every spiritual blessing that they've received in Christ Jesus, could you do a good job of teaching them that? And if you can't, you better pay attention. Because I'm telling you that's what's going to be in our future. Amen. The watcher. For he chose us in him. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now do you realize that you, in one sense, because of Jesus, you're already holy and blameless in God's sight? I know in the spiritual sense. I know in your mind, your will and emotions, there's a whole lot of conflicts in your heart. But in another sense, you are perfect in Christ. And you, can you live with that dichotomy? Because God lives with it. I'm telling you, as you sit there now, you're a blood-washed, blood-bought son and daughter of the King. And God is smiling over you. And God is pleased with you. And God does not treat you as your sins deserve. And as far as the east is from the west, he has removed your transgressions from you. And between you and God, there's no limits and he's happy with you. And on another sense, God is busy, got his fingers in the dirt of your heart. And he's busy cleansing your heart. And he's, and he's not holding your sin against you, but he's busy cleaning all of that. I was going to swear, all of the bad stuff out of your life. He's, now, to me, to live with those two tensions is huge. God fully loves me, stoked about me, so excited about me, just thinks I'm the best thing on the planet, but he's got no illusions about what the actual state of my heart is down there in many things. Remember what I said last week, agape love. He's not turned off by the good things about you, and he's Definitely not turned off by your ugliness. He's just in love with you. That does something to me. Helpful? Carry on reading. Watch out. In love. What's, what's motivating him? Love. In love. He predestined you, us, to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It was God's pleasure and his will and his love that he chose you to be saved. Nothing of yourself. Listen to this. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Now the one he loves, who's that? That's Jesus, eh? Because that's a capital O. He loves you. You're one of the ones he loves. But the way that his love came to you was through the one he loved. Amen? Now it says at verse 7, In him, in Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, 
Guys, help me now. Based on last year's teachings, verse 7 and 8. I can t- see the two forms of God's grace there. What are the two forms of God's grace? Hey? Saving or forgiving grace. And then empowering grace. Okay, so let's unpack it for a second. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Okay, that is God's mercy. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay, God's forgiving grace, God's mercy is that Jesus' blood was shed on the cross to forgive you of your sins and his sacrifice was once for all time. Amen? That's God's forgiving grace to you. It's one of this every spiritual blessing that you have in Christ Jesus. Then it says there, verse 8, in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Okay, now, help me now. The second form of God's grace is empowering grace, eh? Now, when you read wisdom and understanding, what form of empowering grace are you thinking about? Because I'm thinking about a very specific one. And? Yes. Okay, so those, those are the two, the ones that are mentioned. But if you understand last year's teaching, they come as a package. The seven spirits of God, eh? Okay, so... Um, Dougie, put up for me slide number slide number 14 there, but just tell me when it's up, guys, so that I can just reference it, okay? He's saying there that God has lavished you with spiritual wisdom and understanding. Am I right? It's up, hey? Where? There, it'll go up there. Okay. Laka. So So Killer, you you said it. There it is there. That picture comes from Zechariah chapter 4. We spent seven weeks unpacking that picture last year. And that picture represents the the sevenfold spirit that is before God's throne. Do you remember? From Revelation 4, from Revelation 1, from Zechariah chapter 4. And it also is referenced in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 3. And it speaks about the seven manifestations of the spirit of God that rested on Jesus. Amen? Now, what were those seven manifestations? The Spirit of the Lord. God is love. So the first one is love. The Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, you you need, you need to understand, every one of you have got access to God's throne and have got, got access to God's love. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God pours his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. One of the spiritual blessings you have in Christ Jesus, any time you need love, how do you get it? You ask. You come boldly into God's throne room to receive empowering grace to help you to love more. To help to love your husband when you want to rip his head off. To help you to love your wife when you want to rip her head off. To help you to love your children when you want to kill them. To help your children to love you when they want to kill you. To help you to love your customers. To help you to love your suppliers. To help to love fellow staff members. To help you to love the government or the political party you hate. To help you to love people in the church that you don't get on with. To help you to love anywhere you need love for anything you can oh, you can approach your father in heaven and you say lord you have blessed me with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus and i want to access that blessing now i'm asking you father please give me your love you get it you get it you have not because you ask not Now listen to me now. I promise you, God's general will for your life and every believer's life is that you would be a light to the world. Okay? Jesus was the light to the world. Therefore, we are sitting in a hill. We are a lamp on a lampstand that cannot be hidden. Yes? Now the light that Jesus shone was these seven false spirits. As we learn how to access God's presence 
and receive those seven spirits, manifestations of the Spirit of God from Him. Now watch here. This is amazing. As you allow God to love you, as you allow God to fill you with His wisdom, as you allow God to fill you with His understanding, with His power, with His knowledge, with the fear of Him, and with His counsel, when, God is able, when, you, when you come to God and you're able to eat from God and receive from God these seven manifestations of the Spirit, guess what happens to your life? It's transformed. You become strong. But watch this. So that thing is flowing to you, right? But now what happens, Jenny? As you learn to access God for these things, it becomes second nature. It starts off, you're changing gears, you're not sure. But eventually you just, you get it going, right? Now someone comes to you, Zander, for counsel. They need wisdom. They're struggling to love their wife. You just click in and you say, Father, help me to help this person. Lord, what do I say? Lord, give me your love. Lord, show me understanding, wisdom, knowledge. And I I, I know exactly how it happens. The Lord reveals things to you in your heart. It's almost like thinking, but it's not thinking. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And he gives you an answer. He gives you a solution. He tells you something for them. And now what's happened is, God hasn't just manifest himself to you for your sake. God has manifest himself to you for that person's sake. And now to that person, the seven manifestors of of the Spirit are flowing from the Lord to you through them. And now you are becoming a light to them. My friend. And when that happens, your, your Christianity your, your spiritual walk with God, it does a bull run. The price, your share price goes from 10 to 100 bucks overnight because you've tasted and seen that God is good. There Steve is there. Me and Andre were doing some stuff with Steve in the middle of last year. Steve said to us before, they says, you know, I'm not too sure about this airy fairy stuff. <laughs> After that meeting, he says, Oh, this airy fairy stuff is real. Eh? <laughs> it blessed me, but I've literally seen that man transforming before my eyes. Because he is starting to realize that there's a God in heaven. Now, of course, he's always been saved, but he's starting to realize that God is for him, that God is with him, and God is working. And as he works with him, God can flow to him, but not just to him, but through him. And it's changing his marriage. And it's changing his business. And it's changing his parenting. And it's changing him. And it doesn't matter how fast or slow. The only thing that matters is this change. Is this helpful what I'm trying to show you guys? Okay. Now, just put that slide up again, please, Doug, if you don't mind. Because this is the most amazing revelation that I've also had. In Zechariah, it says there, um, It is not by might, nor by power, but how? By my spirit, says the Lord. Jenny, don't worry. I'm going to send all of these slides to everyone, and you all are going to get these slides from the whole weekend, okay? So you don't have to worry about photos. I'm going to send them all to you. Now, Ian, when someone says to you, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, what comes to mind? Because there's two extremes to the scripture. Okay, so you saying that relaxes you. And uh, um, honestly, that's the first thing it should do for you. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That should relax you beautifully, okay? But, and that's what actually we're going for. But let me tell you the two extremes that I've seen in my life and I've seen in people's lives as I've led people over the years. The one extreme is this. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. In other words, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do nothing. God's going to do everything. (laughs) 
You know what happens when nothing happens? Nothing happens. This is the problem I have with um, evolution, you know? Nothing was there, nothing exploded, and then from nothing something came, you know? Nothing. I cannot think of one place in the Bible where someone did nothing and God did everything. Yep. Please, if you can bring it to me, I'd love to hear from you. Always, from Genesis to Revelation, when God wants to do something, he tells a man to do something, or a woman, or whoever, or a donkey even. Okay? They do that thing, and then big stuff happen. Okay? So the one extreme is, let go, let God. You do nothing, God does everything. Here's the other extreme. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> now let me tell you what's behind that. You do everything and God does nothing. Because you're not sure about this God. And he's not so reliable. And he's not so dependable. And you know, you just, oh, just don't know if he's going to be bad today or good today. So you just better make sure that you cover your bases. So that if God doesn't come through, well, at least you did something. Now, I'm being a little bit funny, but I'm, <laughs> I just need you to be honest with yourself and how you think about God and yourself and all of these things at times. Are you with me? And it's like, I, I, if I have a default, my default, work. Work hard. Do you, be faithful. Be faithful with the general will. Be faithful. Come on. You've got to be faithful. Come on. You know, you, come on. You've got to do better. You've got to be hard better. You've got to... I've lived under performance mentality for most of my life. I didn't have a dad growing up, and the only way you get favor from authorities and men and all of those things, work hard, perform in the sports field, perform in the school, perform, 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 you'll get noticed. And you bring that into a relationship with God, and so you perform for God. Here's the problem. You become the judge. And you rate your performance quite highly. <laughs> Are you with me? And then you perform. But then you expect God to bless that performance. And most times, you don't think he blessed you enough for the performance that you did. Okay, number one. Now, there's another problem here. Sometimes you perform. Let's say this is the standard, but you performed here. You are miserable so-and-so for the week. And you crawl into your little shell and, oh, I'm so bad and how can God love me and I've failed him again and ticket this and no, no, no. And you just down because you feel God is unhappy and God is angry because you didn't perform and God is judging you and he's just, he's about to, if he, if he, if he, if he walks past you, he's going to scop you one because, you know, yeah, you're lazy. Come on, you can't even do it. But you can go from that to this. Here's the bar. You do one thing well, and you know you smash it out the park. You walk around. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> You're so lucky to have me. <laughs> You're all laughing because you know this is in your heart. This has been in your heart. Yes? Are you with me? No, this is, this, I'm describing to you, hey, God helps you help themselves. This attitude, right? And you are full of pride and arrogance. Now, of course, you will never admit it to yourself. Are you with me? But you really think that God is looking down on you and he's got a big smile on his face. And you mistakenly think that God is somehow turned on by your performance that was better than average. And when you fit, fall into that trap, you fall into this trap because you think that when you didn't perform, God is turned off by your lack of performance. I, I hope you, ho guys, open your heart wide tonight and just be honest with yourself. Now, this is what I understand now 
more than, again, I'm learning these things, eh? It's been a revelation to me. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Quickly go with me to, to, to 1 Chronicles 14. Okay, and we're going to read from verse 8. Can I read? When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king, they went out, up in full first to search for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. Now watch out, verse 10. So David inquired of God, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? You have not because you? Okay, did he ask? Yes. Has he positioned himself correctly? Is he trying to line up with the Father's will? He doesn't want to take it for granted that it's the Father's will that he must go fight them. So what's he doing? He's like, Lord, can I go fight them? And will you help me? The Father says, check here. The Lord answered, go. I will hand you over to them over to you. Oh. So now the Father's saying, go fight them. He's saying, okay, I'm going. Verse 11. So David his men went up to Paul Perism, and there he defeated them. And he said, listen to what he says. Okay, now I'm going to read it from the NLT quickly. Because the NLT, I love the NLT. Listen to what the NLT says. So David and his troops went up to Baal Perizim and defeated the Philistines there. Next, next, next scripture, NLT. God did it! David exclaimed. Watch ya. Who did it? Who does God say, David say did it? God did it. Next, next line. He used me, sorry, he used me to burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So they named that place Baal Perizim, which means the Lord who bursts through. Now I want to ask you now, help me now. God did it or David did it? Huh? That's what it is. David says God did it. But then he says, God used me, so he acknowledges God, to burst through my enemies like a raging flood. It wasn't, let go and let God. Hey guys, we're just going to stand here and watch. God's going to just blow through our enemies. And it wasn't like, hey, it doesn't matter what God says, we're going to fight those oaks. God helps us help themselves. It was, no, 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 no. We're going to line up. Lord, is it your will? Yes, it's my will, son. Will you be with me? Yes. Okay, go, boy. Boom, he gives him a hiding. I think I told you the story about Michael. Gets his marks from a trick. He was thinking he was going to get three A's. He got six and a B. He sends us a screenshot of his marks. Guess what the next words, words are under the WhatsApp? Glory to God. Now, I'm using that because I need you to see the emotion that he's feeling. David is feeling this. Come on. I can't believe God you did it. Now, I want to tell you. Did David, did, did God write Michael's exams for him? No chance. Michael went and wrote every single one of those exams. But in my house, if you've ever been to my house, in my lounge, I've got this couch. And every morning, I have my quiet time on this couch. And Michael's room is just behind my couch. Every morning. Before he went for exam, come stand in front of the couch. Do you want me to pray for you? Please, Dad. What do you want me to pray? I need the sevenfold spirit of God. What you, I need the spirit of wisdom, of knowledge, of counsel, of understanding, of power. I need God's help to write this exam. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you hear Michael's heart. He's asking you. He's upping you. Father, won't you come? He gets his marks back. What's the first thing? God, glory to God. He's humble enough to admit that I wrote the exam, but God did it. Because he knew best he could do three A's, but with God's help, six and a B. <sighs> do you know what a revelation this is to me? I'm thinking myself, I'm 51. This light is 19. He's learning this lesson at 19. God, I wish I learned this lesson at 19. Do you know how much pain I would have saved myself of 31 years? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm being real. You get this now, young people. You've got a head start like you can't believe. 
Not by might nor by power is exactly what you said, Lisa. It's always a combination of a partnership between God and man. And man must ask God, hear God, and obey God. And when man lines up with God, lines up with his will, and obeys him, then God says, You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You've got full access to all seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Paul just mentions two of them here in Ephesians. But we all know we've got access to seven. I'm asking you now, are you accessing? Are you accessing God's throne for mercy for when you've messed up? And are you accessing God's throne for empowering grace before you mess up? Alan Poffert was talking to our, at our Elders Connect Thursday last week. Uh, what's that guy's name? The Artie Kendall. You know Artie Kendall, the guy from America? Artie Kendall, he's a theologian of note. He, he, he led Westminster Chapel in England for many years. He sat under Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Alan was telling us every single morning, R.T. Kendall wakes up and he says, I wash myself in the blood of Jesus. And I silence every voice with the blood of Jesus. I silence my conscience with the blood of Jesus. Ever wake up in the morning and your conscience is nailing you? Who can relate? How do you silence your conscience? Mercy. In whom we have, through his blood, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, we have the, through his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus, that even though I condemn myself, your sacrifice was once, and your blood was shed on the altar to forgive me of my sins. Lord, you know I don't want to sin. You know I'm fighting against sin. But Lord, I've fallen. Forgive me. Or the enemy, his voice is coming to accuse you. You silence his voice with the blood. Or, I watch this, this clip. You know, Julius Malema talking about the March 20 shutdown. He is giving Cyril Ramaphosa a hiding of note. Accusing the guy. Now listen, I think to myself, mm, but you're calling this guy corrupt. I don't know that your pocket is so clean, my friend. You know what I'm trying to say? But I'm seeing this guy accuse our president. And I think to myself, I'm watching and I felt the Lord say to me, Bruce, are you at a place where you're so secure in me that if people make videos that about you and they post them on the internet and that you watch them, that you could be secure in your position in me and your blood and it could be water for like a duck, it could be like water for a duck's back? Because that's what they did to Jesus. Jesus said, if they've called me the prince of Bel Belshebub and the, and, the, and the kind of the king of the house, a demon-possessed oak, how much more won't they call you that? Beware when all men win sp speak well of you. Anyway, off the point. Bottom line is, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. One of those is God's mercy, his forgiving grace. Do you Allow God's mercy to wash over you every day. And do you silence all the voices? And do you listen to the one voice? And you allow him to wash you. If not, you're not accessing. And my friend, if you can't access because you're feeling disqualified, then you can't, for, for mercy, for forgiveness, then how are you ever going to access for empowering? The goal is to live empowering. The goal is to live the seven manifestations. But if you're not even doing it on the blood, how are you going to do it there? Helpful? Listen to, look at verse 12 of verse 1 Chronicles 14. The Philistines abandoned their gods there and David gave orders to burn them. It reminds me of the story of Jericho and I. 
They have victory at Jericho. So they go to I. Am I right? Do they inquire of God about taking out I? They don't inquire. And what happens in I? They get a hiding and the enemies defeat them. And why? Because Achan had stolen some of the gods from Jericho. And God was not with them. Am I right? David gives orders to burn all the idols. Now watch what happens, verse 13. After a while, the Philistines returned and raided the valley again. Verse 14. Once again. Say once again. David asked God what to do. You know what one of my biggest problems in my life has been? Presumption. I presume to know God's will. God did it this way, then he'll do it again now. 2000, when did I do that big fast? 2018. Yeah, 2018. I did a 40-day fast 2018. One of my glands here got a crystal blocked in it. My full face puffed up like a chipmunk. Now I'm fasting, eh? I can't take cortisone. I've got nothing in my tummy. It'll burn a hole right through my tummy. I don't know what to do. I'm trusting God to heal me, but um, my face is going to burst. <laughs> the Lord tells me, go to Sylvia, Dr. Sylvia, Morris's wife. I said to Sylvia, can't have anything in my stomach. She says, no problem. We'll put a drip on you. We'll put cortisone in. Go there. I'm sitting there. She says, look, I, just before we do all this, I want to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, heal Bruce. That I... In an hour, I walk where that thing is gone. Next week, guess what happens? This side. Flipping the other side. Presumption. I don't ask God, what should I do? I don't say, Lord, please heal me. Hey, Sylvia, can I come for a drip and a cortisone thing? Yes, pull in. I pull in there. He doesn't pray for me. Put it on. I leave, still there. I'm driving home. I phone her. I say, Sylvia, the thing hasn't worked. She said, you are not bothering me. I said, Sylvia, you didn't pray for me. She says, Bruce, you know what? When you left here, I felt the Holy Spirit say, you didn't pray for him. I say, Sylvia, pray for me, please. (laughs) My phone is here, but she prays for me. Within half an hour, that thing's gone. It was like the Lord just showed me. Don't presume, but ask me. Check here, David. Second time the Philistines come. He doesn't presume because God did it then. He wants to do it now. Check what he does here. Once again, once again, David asks what to do. Watch what God says. Do not attack them straight on. The last time he attacked them straight on. Those are not idiots. They went back, they debriefed about that thing, they thought, flip, when he comes for us full on, we better do this. They were ready for a full on attack. God knew that. Instead, circle around behind them, attack them from the poplar trees in the rear. Now verse 15, watch here. This 15 is amazing. When you hear the sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, go out and attack. That will be the signal that God is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. Now guys, Yes, I'm going to land now. What the hell has got the rustling trees got to do with military strategy? Nothing unless you're spiritual. Unless God has spoken to you and you've got fluffy stuff from Him. And he's, there's two things. You need to know how to attack and you need to know when to attack. Because the right place to attack at the wrong time, disaster. But when you've got the right attack and at the right time, bah, and that's what happens. So David and his God, so David did what God commanded. They struck down the Philistine army all the way to Ibn Giza. I can just see it. They've got all their big, big oaks in the front because the last time they came from the front. Eh, the Lord's laughing. He's like, yeah. Coming from behind and just give them an enema from the back. Bah! 
and he'd take them all out. Right. Military strategy, business strategy, family strategy, home cell strategy, work strategy, parenting strategy, all strategy, all stuff. Ask God, inquire of God. You've got access to the throne. You've got access to the seven manifestations of the Spirit of God. You have not because you ask not. Last thing and I'm done. What's the result of this? Verse 17. So David's fame spread everywhere. The Lord, say the Lord, caused all the nations to fear David. Because God is being a lamp to David. David is being a lamp to Israel. Because God can be a light house to us. We can be a lighthouse to the nations. But not let go and let God. And not God helps who help themselves. Intimate partnership between God and his sons and daughters. That's the general will of God for every one of your lives this year. That you learn how to go to ride the car. How to be led by the Spirit. How to walk in step with the Spirit. How to inquire of God, hear from Him, and to walk in it. Is this helpful? Why don't you stand with me? I don't want to draw this out, my friends. But won't you just do some business with God? Say, Lord... Teach me about your fatherhood. Father me ever. I want to be a good son. I want to be a good daughter in your kingdom. Help me, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name to do your general will well. Show me every spiritual blessing that I have been blessed with because of Jesus. Lord, help me to apply this knowledge into my life so that it becomes second nature. Teach me that it is not by might my might or my power but it's by your power but it's me learning to work in partnership with you and that's like how I can relax like Ian said teach me to relax in you and to enjoy life Reveal your love to me, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, guys, you're not going to hear anything new today and tomorrow, but I promise you what I think God is doing, you know, you can hear things over time and then he can just drop them in in a second and it all clicks into place. Click, click, click. And I think what's going to happen this weekend, there's going to be a whole lot of click, 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 clicks. Click. 